Hey, welcome back. Today we're going to be looking at Beowulf and talking about the first around 200 lines, up to line 195, which I sometimes like to call the prologue. It sets up the history and the situation before we really get to meet the hero. But even though it's a prologue, it's very exciting, and there's lots of really fantastic stuff in this, including a man-eating monster. Last time we talked about all the poetic and cultural qualities one might find in Anglo-Saxon poetry, and in, specifically in the poem Beowulf. Today, as we go through the prologue, I'll point out many examples of those things we were talking about last time. I'm going to be looking a lot at Seamus Haney's translation. There are many good translations, this is just the one I happen to be teaching from in my own classroom. In Anglo-Saxon, the poem opens up with the word, what? Seamus Haney translates that word as, so. Hal Chickerling instead translates it, listen. Tolkien translates it with the classic, lo. But the point is the word is an interjection. It is a call to attention, trying to get the listeners, the audience, to tune in to the poem that's about to unfold. Remember this poem originally stems from an oral tradition, the shopes in the bead halls who were singing their songs. And so the shope may strike the first note, sing the first chord, and call everyone to attention so that they can hear this exciting adventure story. Wait. And so after the shope calls us into attention, we begin the story. The Spear Danes in days gone by and the kings who ruled them had courage and greatness. We have heard of those princes' heroic campaigns. We begin talking generally about the clans and we zoom in on the Danes. I mentioned several clans in the last video and how each of these is sort of vying for power and success in their world. In some ways, the beginning of this poem is a song to the heroism of the Danes of the past and how this clan was established and made strong. In line four, it introduces a new character, there was Shield Sheafson, scourge of many tribes, a wrecker of mead benches, rampaging among foes. This terror of the hall troops had come far. A foundling to start with, he would flourish later on as his powers waxed and his worth was proved. In the end, each clan on the outlying coast beyond the whale road had to yield to him and begin to pay tribute. That was one good king. And so we meet this mythic figure, Shield, Shield Sheafson, and he becomes a mythic origin story for the lineage of the Danes, the dynasty of the Shieldings. And although he's not a real character, he ties in nicely with these kind of hero myths. He comes from nowhere. He's a, a foundling. In fact, a little bit later, it describes him being washed up on their shore in a boat as a child with absolutely nothing. Out of this mysterious past, he comes from nowhere and rises to power. We mentioned in the last video those cultural traits of courage and prowess, as well as generosity, both of which are going to become important here very quickly. But notice the prowess. He's able to beat back all of their opponents, all of their neighbors, until everyone around them is under their control and their sway rapidly gaining and consolidating power for the Danes. His last name, Sheafson, also has a bit of a reference there. It's associated with a sheaf, as in a collection of wheat or grain. In some of the myth stories, a, a child will wash up on shore holding a sheaf of grain, and that sheaf becomes a metaphor for agriculture, a provider, someone who brings food to the people. So not only is shield a protector, as a shield, but he's also a provider, bringing sheaves. He gives them strength, and he gives them prosperity. And after we establish this lineage, then he has a child. The text says, He knew what they had told, the long times and troubles they'd come through without a leader. So the Lord of life, the glorious Almighty, made this man renowned. Shield had fathered a famous son. Bao's name was known through the north. So Shield fathers a son named Bao. There are many disputed manuscript errors about this particular name, but Tolkien notes that Bayo may be associated with barley, just as his father was associated with a sheaf of wheat. And so Bayo is continuing the tradition of prosperity for his people. Not only that, but he exhibits the kind of behavior that's admired. A young prince must be prudent like that, giving freely while his father lives, so that afterwards in age, when fighting starts, steadfast companions will stand by him and hold the line. 
So while his father is still alive, Bayo exhibits great generosity, which again adds to the strength of the bonds he has so that when he rises to power, he's clearly the right choice, establishing this dynasty. Both Shield and Bayo are mythic characters, but right after this, Bayo's son is called Halfdane, and he is a historical figure. And so we have this interesting blend of mythic lineage as well as history. This is very common among these old Anglo-Saxon stories and songs, a way of establishing where we come from all the way back into mythology. But before we get to Halfdane, there's a funeral scene we have to watch. Shield was still thriving when his time came and he crossed over into the Lord's keeping. His warrior band did what he bade them when he laid down the law among the Danes. They shouldered him out to the sea's flood, the chief they revered who had long ruled them. A ringworld prow rode in the harbor, ice-clad, outbound, a craft for a prince. They stretched their beloved lord in his boat, laid out by the mast, amidships the great ring-giver. Far-fetched treasures were piled upon him in precious gear. I never heard before of a ship so well furbished with battle tackle, bladed weapons, and coats of mail. The mast treasure was loaded on top of him. He would travel far out into the ocean's sway. This beautiful description of a funeral scene. He's laid in the boat for the what we call the Viking burial, right? And he's piled high with treasure, and they push it out into the ocean and watch it drift away. This perfectly mirrors his arrival. When he arrived with absolutely nothing, here he is leaving with great treasure, showing the success between the two. But he comes from a mysterious somewhere beyond, and he goes also to a mysterious somewhere beyond. We see that that idea of the great hero who arrives sort of out of nowhere and then drifts back into nowhere in the end is a common old story thing. You think, might think of Arthur and the, the death of King Arthur as well. And Bayo takes over and does a good job, but it quickly moves on to his descendants. After Bayo is Halfdane, the first real historic king. Halfdane has four children. One of them is a daughter who her name is broken out of the manuscript because of the damage to the original manuscript of Beowulf. It was in a fire back in the 1700s and was barely rescued, and some parts are still damaged. Fortunately, we still preserve this wonderful poem. But the daughter of Halfdane marries Onella the Swede. And so we see another clan coming into play here. The Danes are our main focus, but the Swedes are over there on the side. And that link with the Swedes is going to be important later on. The second child of Halfdane is Hrothgar. We don't hear exactly what happens to his brother, but Hrothgar does eventually take the throne, and we focus in on him. By line 65, we see that Hrothgar is gaining in power and is being so successful as a king and is so prosperous and gaining so much wealth and fame that he decides to build for himself a great mead hall. We talked about how very central the mead hall was to this life. The king sitting there and giving out treasure to his thanes, the thanes gather, gathered around to celebrate their victories, the queen passing the cup to the great thanes, the shope singing a song. All of this is very important. So Hrothgar decides to establish a beautiful, beautiful mead hall named Herod. He sends for all these materials, he builds this beautiful hall, and he fills his role of sitting there and passing treasure out, that generosity that we expect of an Anglo-Saxon ruler. Right in the middle of describing this hall and its wonder, the text says, The hall towered, its gables wide and high, and awaiting a barbarous burning. That doom abided, but in time it would come, the killer instinct unleashed among in-laws, the bloodlust rampant. The Anglo-Saxon sense of fate and doom hints in the foreshadowing here. Although this hall is beautiful now, its destruction will come eventually. It's going to burn. And in fact, the burning of the hall isn't an important part of the story at all. There's just that constantly that sense of uh, foreshadowing and doom in Anglo-Saxon poetry. But when we look closely at where this burning comes from, especially since we're about to meet some monsters, we see that the burning doesn't come from some sort of hideous monster that crawls out of the deep, but rather it comes from in-laws and bloodlust. The destruction of beautiful things comes from the violence inherent in the culture and the clashes between clans. We've seen that sometimes the clans marry off their daughters to other clans in order to try to establish some kind of peace but that frequently breaks apart. And in fact, that's what's going to happen to Herod. 
they're going to try to make peace with the Heathelbards, and it's not going to go well. And it's going to lead to lots of fighting and lots of destruction. And so when we look at the monsters, when the monsters actually come, we see, of course, these are, are mythic elements. These are, are elements of, of fairy tale and storytelling. And yet in some ways, the monsters reflect the violence and cruelty within people themselves. They're in some ways a projection of the evil that uh, we see in our failure to unite and hold together. This monster is going to be introduced in the very next lines. Then a powerful demon, a prowler through the dark, nursed a hard grievance. It harrowed him to hear the din of the loud banquet every day in the hall, the harp being struck and the clear song of a skilled poet telling with mastery of man's beginnings, how the Almighty had made the earth a gleaming plain girdled with waters. In his splendor he set the sun and the moon to be earth's lamplight, lanterns for men and fill the broad lap of the world with branches and leaves and quickened life in every other thing that moved. In the hall, they're singing songs. The shope, the poet, is singing songs of creation and the things that God has made. Remember that balance I talked about between the Christianity of the poet and the pagan culture that he's talking about here. In this case, we see sort of a united idea of a creator God. And that wonder at creation and the wonder at the almighty power that created this world offends this creature of darkness, making him crawl out and want revenge. It hurts him to hear the beautiful singing. Line 99. So times were pleasant for the people there until finally one, a fiend out of hell, began to work his evil in the world. Grendel was the name of this grim demon haunting the marshes, marauding round the heath and the desolate fens. He had dwelt for a time in misery among the banished monsters, Cain's clan, whom the Creator had outlawed and condemned as outcasts. For the killing of Abel, the Eternal Lord had exacted a price. Cain got no good from committing that murder, because the Almighty made him anathema. And out of the curse of his exile there sprang ogres and elves and evil phantoms, and the giants too, who strove with God time and again until he gave them their reward. Again, here's that place where the poet creates that balance. So he's got this monster, and this monster comes from a tradition of mythology, the dark Scandinavian monsters. And if you look at like Norse mythology, which you may be familiar with, you'll see things like the, the Jotun, the, the giants that Thor is always fighting, or the dark elves, or some other creatures that lurk in the dark that the gods are always in contest with. Well, the poet is keeping that part of the tradition. That's a, that's a key part of the story. But he's found a way to work it into Christianity somehow. He's made these creatures the descendants of Cain, the cursed one. In the Bible, Cain was the first murderer, the one who killed his brother out of jealousy. And you can see how significant the idea of brother killing is in Anglo-Saxon culture. After killing his brother, Cain is cursed. And in this text, all of his descendants are these monsters. And Grendel, being a descendant of murder and violence, a child of violence, comes back to hate the creator. There's one fun Anglo-Saxon word in the midst here. Haney translates it as evil phantoms, but the word is orkness, dead walkers, kind of like a kind of creeping zombie kind of thing. But you can also see the root there, orc, which has to do with death. And Tolkien, of course, used that as the name of some of his most notorious villains, the orcs. They were corruptions of what was good and death out of life. Obviously, he was very inspired by Anglo-Saxon poetry. So in the night, Grindel sneaks into the hall and sees them all passed out after their parties and celebrations. Suddenly then, the god-cursed brute was creating havoc. Greedy and grim, he grabbed thirty men from their resting place and rushed to his lair, flushed up and inflamed from the raid blundering back with the butchered corpses. And then as dawn brightened and the day broke, Grindel's powers of destruction were plain. Their wassail was over. They wept to heaven and mourned in their mourning. Their mighty prince, the storied leader, sat stricken and helpless, humiliated by the loss of his guard, bewildered and stunned, staring aghast at the demon's trail in deep distress. So Hrothgar, who was a good hero, he was 
full of prowess, he had a lot of accomplishments, he was successful, he was obviously very generous to his men. He's been the hero up to this point, now finds himself powerless in the face of this creature and this monster. This is not a force he knows how to beat. And the force is not going to stop, because the very next night Grindle comes back and eats and murders a whole bunch more people. And so it continues on and on and on. It was easy then to meet with a man shifting himself to a safer distance, to bed in the bothies, for who could be blind to the evidence of his eyes, the obviousness of that hall watcher's hate. Whoever escaped kept a weather eye open and moved away. Hrothgar's men aren't cowards, but they're smart enough to realize if you're going to keep staying in this hall, you're going to be eaten. And so they begin to slowly back away and stay back. The hall becomes the haunt of a cursed creature. That was kind of alliterative. So Grindel ruled in defiance of right, one against all, until the greatest house in the world stood empty, a deserted wallstead. Twelve years goes by, the suffering continues, there's no relief, and the text talks about negotiating with Grindel, how impossible it is to negotiate with a force like this. If this were just uh, a violent person who had inflicted some kind of violence on our community, we could talk it out. We might be able to get Wurgild. Remember Wurgild? He would never parlay or make peace with any Dane, nor stop his death dealing, nor pay the death price. This isn't a force you can bargain with. He swoops in in the night, in the dark, devours and destroys, and then sneaks away again. And so how do the people respond? What do they do, other than running away and hiding? These were hard times, heartbreaking for the prince of the shieldings. Powerful counselors, the highest in the land, would lend advice, plotting now how best the bold defenders might resist and beat off sudden attacks. Sometimes at pagan shrines they vowed offerings to idols, swore oaths that the killer of souls might come to their aid and save the people. That was their way, their heathenish hope. Deep in their hearts they remembered hell. The almighty judge of good deeds and bad, the Lord God, head of the heavens and high king of the world, was unknown to them. O cursed is he who in time of trouble has thrust his soul in the fire's embrace, forfeiting help, he has nowhere to turn. But blessed is he who after death can approach the Lord and find friendship in the Father's embrace. This passage, of course, clearly shows the tension between the Christianity and the Scandinavian myth pagan culture. And in fact, the language is so strong here that Tolkien thought that there was a section of it that had been inserted later on by another monk who felt like maybe the first poet wasn't being explicitly Christian enough. The idea is the temptation of idolatry to these pagan heroes, turning to the, their old gods in a time of trouble instead of trusting in the creator. And that temptation is a kind of satanic temptation. And ultimately, that leads further to their destruction rather than helping them. There's no help to be had from their gods of the past. Rather, they're better off trusting the creator god to straighten this out for him. After all, he's the force who is opposed to Grendel. We see that in the imagery of Cain. We see that in the imagery of Grendel's reaction to the songs of the creator. But the people's failed attempts to find other help in their desperation is clearly looked at as a negative thing in this point. And so that's where the prologue leaves off, in a desperate situation. Hrothgar, a good king, is being destroyed by a force of unrelenting evil. What we need now is a hero. The kind of hero who will fill this void and exhibit both those ancient Anglo-Saxon character traits of heroism as well as the bold Christian heroism that our poet is looking for. Who's it gonna be? We'll find out next time. Thanks for watching. You can click to subscribe or to watch another video, and I'll see you next time when we really get into the fun characters of this point. Bye bye. What? 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 It's probably in a minor case since it's a monster story. Where?